Thank you, Coburn. Uh, what I said was, uh, if you give me too professional of an introduction, no one will believe that we know each other. I hope to help prove that here over the next 45 minutes. When you, uh, when you give talks at conferences, uh, they encourage you to carefully pick your title, to wordsmith your title, to make a promise, to give people something that they can rely on and look forward to as part of the presentation. Because after all, this is a group of professionals at a professional conference here to learn professional things. So we have some examples of that. This is Ed Hunter. Ed leads our uh, performance capacity planning and operating system group at Netflix. Tomorrow at 4, you can hear Ed talking about managing OS release transitions at Netflix scale, how we keep hundreds of thousands of EC2 instances updated and running without taking down the service. It's a great title. You know exactly what to expect, and you know what you're going to learn. So, you know, good job, Ed. This is Nora. Nora will be speaking Wednesday at 4.30. She's a senior engineer at Netflix, and she likes to focus on resilient systems, the people that operate them, and that intersection. So you can come see chaos engineering, a step toward resilience. You'll learn all the benefits of chaos engineering, why you should make the investment, and all of the things that you can understand and look forward to when you adopt chaos engineering. Title is very clear, it's well written, and it's very professional. But this is what you just signed up for. This is the talk that you just actually walked into. So today, we're going to talk about failure at Netflix Velocity. So something else I tell you about conference talks is you should have an anchor word or an anchor phrase that the audience can attach to for different parts of the talk. It should be clean, it should be clear. How about velocity? We put that in the title of the talk, but velocity really only matters when we have something large moving quickly, right? Something small moving quickly eh, might be interesting, but something large moving quickly, especially when it hits something immovable and it's no longer working quickly or moving quickly is much more interesting. But if I'm going to anchor you on velocity, I have to give you an idea of our size and our velocity and give you some shared concept that we can use together so that hopefully the rest of what I have to say to you makes some sense. So this is called Netflix by the Numbers. Netflix runs hundreds of billions of events through our data pipeline systems every day. And these aren't our metrics. These are information bits from our back-end servers. These are information bits from the client that maybe you have running in your pocket. You've selected something on the UI. You've chosen to play something back. That's an event. We look at hundreds of billions of those every day. There are tens of billions of requests handled by our edge systems every day. And keep in mind, this has nothing to do with the actual video bits. This is just everything else. We have billions of time series metrics that we update every minute that give us an idea of how our systems are behaving. We stream hundreds of millions of hours of entertainment to our customers every day. There are tens of millions of active devices talking to the Netflix systems right now. There are millions of containers up and running, answering customer requests, encoding media, participating in some of those large algorithms and calculations that you hear Netflix people talk about. We do this with hundreds of thousands of EC2 instances running at Amazon. We scale in and out tens, and th tens of thousands of those instances every day. To give you a bit of a scale idea, who's familiar with uh, NASA's Pleiades supercomputer? Does a lot of the fun calculations that turn up in all the neat space articles? Runs about a quarter of a million cores. If we use that as a measurement, Netflix scales in and out the Pleiades supercomputer about every day and a half. There are thousands of changes to our production environment every day, the environment that you use to play back Netflix. There are hundreds of microservices that make that system work. We run tens of terabits of video across the Internet every second of every day. If you work for an ISP or your network provider, you're welcome. <laughs> and we do all of this with one singular goal in mind, 
what might that goal be for Netflix? What might that guidepost be out there that's in the distance that informs all of our hiring decisions and technology decisions and content decisions? Maybe that has something to do with a large catalog size. Uh, maybe we want to have the fastest streaming. How about a global footprint? Uh, financial performance should probably be in there somewhere, too. All of these things are important, but they are not the singular goal. They're not the one guidepost that sits out there in the distance. What might that guidepost be? More Adam Sandler movies. <laughs> Again, maybe that's another one of those goals, but it is not the goal. The goal looks more like this. We call this winning moments of truth. So what would a moment of truth be? When someone has some time to make an entertainment decision, they have options available to them. Watch TV, play games, read books. I've heard some people go outside on purpose. Um, they have these options. And when they choose Netflix in that moment, we win that moment of truth. It's important to understand that those moments of truth are fleeting. If someone comes to our service and presses the play button and gets what I call our most unpopular Netflix series, the sign that says, cannot connect to Netflix, I'm sure no one in here has ever seen that, that moment of truth is lost. So I gave you all those numbers not to impress you, but to impress upon you that seconds matter for us at Netflix. If we want to win those moments of truth, we have to do that every second, every second, every second. Because if you think about just some basic math, I told you earlier, we stream hundreds of millions of entertainment every day. You can get an idea how many times somebody's pressing that play button every second of every day. Those seconds are important. So we've done a lot to make sure that we maintain those seconds so that we can win those moments of truth. Professional talks at conferences have different structures. A well-done structure is a bit like an agreement between the presenter and the audience. And you want to make sure that you structure it in such a logical way to where we all move along together and no one gets lost or hits a speed bump and has to kind of catch back up later on. So transitions from one part of a talk to another are important. And uh, stories are a good way to make that transition. So now that you're all heavily contexted, context, one of our favorite Netflix words, I should tell you a story to transition to the next part of the talk, because that's recommended for professional conference talks. So, Chaos Monkey, who's heard of this little guy? Yeah, me too. Chaos Monkey has been uh, part of the Netflix story for a while. But Chaos Monkey itself is not the important part of that story. You see, years ago when uh, Netflix shifted from operating in the data centers to moving over to the cloud, we made the conscientious decision that we would not lift and shift from our data centers into the cloud. We, would just, we wouldn't just forklift that code and hope that everything would work. That we'd actually have to re-architect. <clears throat> now, that's a great story, but there's, some, of course, some important parts of that. Part of the reason we had to do that is... I know we were made this promise. I'm sure any, any uh, of you that are also writing in Amazon have also heard this promise that those instances you're running on will disappear. For an entirely long list of fabulously good reasons, that particular electronic carpet will get yanked out from under you. So we had an operational theory that we did not want the loss of a running instance to impact a running application. Or said differently, those things should be able to fail without our customers noticing. So that was our operational theory. How do we make sure that that actually gets written that way? How do we make sure that as code changes over time and configuration drifts and all of those things happen, that our new software versions can still be resilient to this? That's what Chaos Monkey did for us. You see, we're really good at designing systems for what's normal. Think about all of those happy path kinds of things that we've already designed for, all the way down to your, you know, the TCP IP stack that runs on our systems assumes that there's a horrible network it's going to have to compensate for. So by making that normal, we could make sure that the software that was written would behave and operate how we wanted it to when things were normal. So Chaos Monkey would run around our production infrastructure, because that's what your customers talk to. To this day, it still runs around our production infrastructure, killing instances. Worked out pretty well. It's still a great model for us. But we started thinking after Chaos Monkey's success that there's some other things there that we could be testing. 
And we went back to the happy path and not so happy path idea. And we theorized that we're pretty good at writing software for the happy path, right? Service A calls service B, service B answers, sends something back. Service A gets what it wants and serves its customer. We're also pretty good at, uh, at writing software for the really sad path, right? Service A calls service B and it's just screaming into the void because service B is not there. But there's a middle area where a lot of those gray failures happen. What if service B answers back but not completely or slowly or intermittently? So we believe that there was a lot of opportunity there to test that. We wanted to engender this idea of graceful degradation. Service A should know what to do to continue to serve its customers when service B is having a bad day. So we designed another monkey, and we called it Latency Monkey. So Latency Monkey was going to insert at our common RPC layer latency. And we'd have two settings for that the percentage of calls that would be impacted, and how much latency to add to that particular call. And just to make sure we're keeping ourselves honest about our impact, we put our primary customer success metric right up at the top. So as you can see, we had the entire UI for this designed by back-end engineers, because that's exactly what it looked like. So we kicked off our first latency monkey test, and we thought, well, what we need to do is we'll pick a victim service. That, by the way, turned out to be a really horrible choice of words, um, but we figured we'd pick a victim service, and what we'd do is we would put some latency between it and the things calling it, and watch to make sure that this graceful degradation idea actually happened, and our hope was all the services calling our victim would just gracefully fall away. So we turned it on. We added 50 milliseconds of latency to 1% of the calls going to this service. Nothing changed. Our customer success metric kept going. I thought, well, yeah, maybe that's a, it's a good start, but that's pretty small. Maybe there's actually an impact there that's somewhere in the noise. So we cranked that, uh, we cranked that impact dial up. Now, we actually talked about really making actual physical dials that we could use, right? You know, latency and impact. And luckily, someone came in and said, yeah, maybe that's not the best way you should be spending your time right now. So reluctantly, we stayed with our non-physical dials. But uh, we cranked our virtual dial there to 50% impact, 50% latency. Fully one out of two calls were now latent up and to the right. Might as well keep going. 100% impact. Everything now is an additional 50% of latency. Nothing's going on. Errors are staying low. People aren't calling the customer service center. And that uh, customer success metric up and to the right. Nary a pixel out of place. Maybe our systems were already resilient to this kind of failure. Maybe we didn't have to worry so much that our, our engineers, you know, had kind of fallen into this trap. So we kept going. Five times the amount of latency to 25% of the calls. Dialed it up and waited. And all we got was proof of more resiliency. So we kept going 50%. One quarter second of latency. Just kept going. People kept pressing the play button. 75%, three out of four calls, 250 milliseconds of latency. We kept going 100%, 250 milliseconds of latency. We were overrunning with confidence. We were high-fiving each other in the room. We'd, we'd proven it. We were resilient to this nasty possible failure case. It's pretty happy. <clears throat> but we'd promised when we sent, our, uh, sent out our little note to the engineering group saying, hey, we're going to goof with stuff, that we'd had some models we built. We'd made some promises, so we thought we'd better keep going. So again, we reached for our virtual dials, and we cranked them. 50% impact, 500 milliseconds of latency, and the, the important, important metric went down this time. And, and it didn't, didn't really come, come back up. <laughs> we'd, we'd learned something, and... And, and down is not the direction we wanted things to go. So, well, we better turn this off, right? So we, we, we dialed back our impact to 0%, um, and it went down a little, little bit further to the, bottom of the, to the bottom of the screen. We thought, well, yeah, maybe, there's, maybe there's something in the model that's a little wrong. Maybe we just need to turn off all the latency to kind of undo everything. So we spun all the virtual dials back to zero, and at this point, the line had crashed so hard it started overriding part of our UI. It was so far to the floor. <clears throat> so, so I'm sure you can guess the high-fiving had stopped at this point as the line was down. Uh, we thought, well, you know, maybe if we turn them to negative numbers, <laughs> maybe we can, we can yank it back up, right? Or, or maybe we'll go back in time and it'll be like this never, ever happened, right? And that, that didn't work either. Um, 
So we had for ourselves a pretty nasty outage that we had to go up and clean up afterward. And we learned a lot of things. Right? We learned uh, we needed to better consider our application behavior. What we learned for our uh, badly termed victim service is that they were actually part of the way through a migration. And they were running two versions of their software on, uh, on each instance. And they would just bounce calls back and forth depending on what feature had been moved from the old version to the new one. And because we had this fabulous common RPC layer, that's how they were calling each other. And they built in a 500 millisecond you know, trip that if it went over 500 milliseconds, you know, it would try harder. And they really didn't worry about backing off too much because, hey, we're just talking to ourselves on the same instance. This should be perfectly safe. And then Latency Monkey comes along and goes, no. So every call that it was making to itself had become latent. And as soon as that happened, we kicked into the try harder pattern. So in a few minutes, that entire service had completely eaten its own feet and fallen over, and we had to wipe it out and start over from the beginning. We also learned a lot about blast radius, right? We decided to infect an entire service, not some instances in a service, not two or three or four, but 100%. And we didn't need to do that. We would have gotten the same learning out of that behavior without knocking that entire service over. Also, frankly, consistency. We laid out a model for what this test was going to be like. And uh, being a little drunk on our success, we spun those virtual dials a little faster than we needed to. We went right to that 50% and 500 millisecond problem, and we killed the system really quickly. Now, we learned a lot from this. It informed uh, our later chaos, uh, chaos engineering experiments and frameworks and how we thought about it and how we talked to people. I'd venture, though, that you already knew all of that. You're practitioners. You've done these kinds of things. You've read those articles. You've watched or created some of your own stunning failures as things broke apart from a high-speed collision. You understand your system's behaviors. You have chaos engineering. You have your unit tests. You have your integration tests and pop quizzes or, you know, all the tests. You have your code reviews. You have your deployment patterns. You have your isolation domains. You already have all of those kinds of things. We had a lot of those kinds of things as well, but we figured out there was still something more to be learned. Both in uh, conference talks and uh, in comedy, it can be important to bring everything back around, to loop something back around to an important phrase or image that you used earlier on, to kind of bring everyone back together. It's another kind of transition. So remember those moments of truth and how they're fleeting? A lot of them got away from us in these particular moments. It took us a while to get the system back up and running. We had a lot of customers who were reading books or playing outside or making other healthy life choices. Um, <laughs> But we decided we were going to have to think differently about failure at Netflix because we knew we were going to grow. We were going to have more customers. We were going to be expanding to more countries. We were going to have more content. So there would be a lot more variability there, which meant that things were also going to get more complex. We'd be, be designing new systems. There would be new features. We'd be hiring new engineers. There would be more data. There would be more devices. There would be more networks. There would be more variables, which meant that any future failures were likely to be more complex and involve more systems and potentially have more impact on customers. So we had to go forward with a new plan for failure at Netflix Velocity. As much as we could plan for failure, we can't reasonably execute on every potential unknown scenario. We just can't do that. But by not making that realization, by not thinking about it, we left a lot of opportunity on the table there to save those moments of truth. So these are some of the things that we learned and we've engendered and become part of the way we think about failure at Netflix. We want our preventative measures to be reasonable. We can't stop making preventative measures. We're not going to stop testing or moving or thinking. But these efforts need to be reasonable. And what do I mean by that? We make sure that we don't over-index too far on past failures. I said prevention is important. But if we over-index too far on these past failures, especially in a, complex, in a complex system, and we try to make sure that that particular failure never happens again, we don't really pay attention to the fact of all of the things that had to be set up and in place for that particular failure to happen. So we're talking about complex systems made up of microservices on hundreds of thousands of instances that are already heavily guarded against failure. That's what all that preventative work does. The realization is that most of the time, these systems are already in some kind of degraded mode. 
these preventative, mail, preventative failures are already kicking in place. Retries are already working. You know, whatever it may be is already happening. So that by the time a failure happens, it's not one or two things that were wrong, but it was a series of some 198 dominoes that had to be knocked over and were only in place in that configuration for that day. And over-indexing on that specific failure means that you're going to build something that makes sure that those 198 dominoes never line up that way again, even though they're probably not going to. Said differently, you know, you can never walk through the same stream twice. By the time you cross it again, it's already changed. We also don't want to over-index on potential future failures. Over-optimization early is an excellent example of this. When we fix for problems that are too far off in the future, we're honestly fixing for something we don't understand well enough to actually fix for it. You see people talking about things like, we got our page render time down really, really low, and someday we hope to have customers. Or we've built these perfect database indexes. Someday we hope to have tables and data. I have this infinitely scalable architecture that I've built, and someday I hope to go from one to two. Right? We're building for problems that we're not going to have for a long time, and that we're not going to understand, but there's another problem that comes from over-indexing on future failures is that it can blind us to those opportunities that are right in front of us. I don't need to be infinitely scalable, but I do need to think about moving from one to two to three to four to five and how I'm going to get there. Again, said differently, be willing to have a problem before you solve for it. Between those two extremes of over-indexing on past failures and future casting too far on future possibilities, really lie, or that's really where the, the things that we want to do lie. Those are our addressable problem sets. We know those well enough to target for them. Another important thing in failure at Netflix Velocity is that we want to proactively invest in resilience. Now, this is one of those things that's easy to kind of head nod at and go, we should always invest in resilience and robustness. That's a fabulous thing. Um, but it needs to be a cognizant choice because if it's not a cognizant choice, if it's not stated, it won't happen. So what does that look like? Everything a lot of us do is driven by those new features. Something new for our, cost, for our customers, some new process, some new development, some new framework, some new something or other. How will our customers use it? How will they benefit from it? How will the business benefit from it? Will they like it? <clears throat> Resiliency needs to be part of that feature development. Because if the system is not available, it doesn't matter about the fabulous new feature you designed if your customers can't use it. So we have to make sure that we've stated that we're investing in resilience just like we're investing in new features. Another part of investing in resilience is to codify good patterns. There are times that we find solutions to problems. We had an interesting one kick up at Netflix a while ago. Uh, a very traditional caching persistence kind of, of framework and problem. You go to your caching layer, you know, some nice very fast key value store and you request a key and you don't get an answer back. Oh, well, that must be a cache miss. So I'll go to the persistence layer, I'll run my query, I'll get the same thing, I'll get my answer back, and I'm going to go tuck that value right back into the persistence layer. It's not necessarily a bad pattern. It's a very common one. However, what we were missing was that what if, it's, uh, what, what if we're getting our cache misses or no answers because the persistence layer is underwater in some way. It's failing. Well, by continuing this pattern, what we were doing was kind of doing the, uh, you know, beatings will continue until performance improves of the caching system. Because at this point, I'd tried to talk to it once, I'd tried to talk to it twice. So we had some of our persistence and caching teams redevelop some of these libraries that people were using to access those systems. And the reason that was beneficial is that they understood those tolerances and reactions better and they could hand out now a codified good operational pattern in the form of a library to people that are hired by Netflix to solve other problems. So we want to codify those good patterns when we find them. Sometimes it's a shared library, sometimes it's project generators, sometimes it's code examples, and sometimes it's as simple as a presentation or just be willing to talk to the rest of the organization about something we should or should not do any longer. We want to make sure that those learnings, that that pain that one set of people had to go through doesn't have to be learned the hard way by everybody else. We also decided, even after our latency monkey experiment turned out to be fail, uh, differently successful, differently successful, that we would continue actively investing in chaos engineering. Chaos engineering is a really interesting space if you haven't had too much of a chance to explore it yet. 
Um, it's coded and, and termed lots of different ways. Breaking things on purpose is, is, one of those, is one of those phrases. But really what chaos engineering does is it provides you an inoculation against those future failures that you can't always predict. It allows you to verify that if you put together a system you behave, that you believe will behave in a certain way, that it will behave in that way even in the turbulent reality that is a production environment. It also gets rid of those problems like, well, it worked on my laptop. You know, unless I can ship your laptop to US East 1 and have Amazon install it for us, it really doesn't matter that it worked on your laptop. We need to make sure that it actually works in the environment that it's going to work in. But most of all, this helps you to manage expectations. If you can draw an engineering organization into the benefits of chaos engineering, they get to verify their designs, how those designs behave when they actually crash into reality. So we made a cognizant choice to invest more in chaos engineering and resilience work, not less. Here's the other thing, and this is one of the big ones, is that we stated that we expect failure to happen. 100% uptime or availability or whatever metric you use to measure is not something that we look at at Netflix. I think all of us would like to pursue the idea that we can build those perfect systems that can do whatever they need to do, whenever they need to do it. But if we don't expect failures, that's when they sneak up on us. They don't become part of our planning. They don't become part of our verbiage. They don't become part, part of our common vernacular. They don't become part of the things that we think about every day. Seen by not stating it, what happens is that uh, failures and the expectation thereof gets functionally deprioritized in the best case scenarios and completely ignored or forgotten about in the worst case scenarios. Part of expecting failures is shifting your thinking to when, not if. It's not if the system fails, it's when the system fails. It's not if your provider has a problem, it's when your provider has a problem. It's not when a new system or code set gets launched, it's when. It's not if there's something you haven't thought of yet, it's when. It's not if someone pushes bad code or bad config, it's when. Always, always, always approach this as a when, not an if and it'll change the way others around you think and behave. Expecting failures means that as we plan forward, recovery is actually a greater strategy than prevention. Again, I said we don't want to not do preventative work, but what we're talking about are those moments that are above whatever your availability measurement is, whether you use nines, pardon me, or error budgets or error reports or whatever it might be. It's for that gap above that that separate you from that 100%. We need to be able to plan for how do we recover the system when all of our genius preventative work doesn't, doesn't save us. Remember we talked about that complex system requiring those 198 dominoes to be set up just this way on a Tuesday morning? We can't predict that. We can't design preventative systems that are going to take into every possible case, every possible eventuality of the failure of a complex system. We talked about graceful degradation earlier, and that's a uh, it's, it's a recognition of that. Netflix does this all the time. Who in here has seen the Netflix UI? Well, good, two of you. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, Netflix currently has a little over 137 million customers worldwide, and each one of those customers can have five profiles. We personalize our recommendations for those profiles for each one of those five profiles for each 137 million accounts, which means we're under, you know, a little under 700 million things that we're deciding this particular profile may enjoy watching. What, what should I recommend to you? What order should I put it in? What visualization should I use to attract you to this particular piece of content? Now, again, imagine that that's provided by a microservice. You actually don't have to imagine because it's provided by a microservice. What happens if that microservice becomes unavailable? Should I just give you the cannot connect to Netflix, go outside and play screen? Or should I do something else? Should I provide you maybe not as personalized results, but something? Maybe, you know, people in your area like this. What was that? Yeah, something. Adam Sandler movies. More Adam Sandler movies, right? That's a form of graceful degradation. That's a form of recovery. The system knows what to do, right? That was some great preventative work. Um, we have another tool, though, that relates to that. Netflix operates in three of Amazon's uh, global regions, U.S. East 1, U.S. West 2, and EU West 1. There are times problems happen in those regions. Sometimes there are things we've done to ourselves. Sometimes it's an underlying systems problem that Amazon is going to have to fix. We can't prevent all of those possible eventualities. 
So we built a recovery mechanism. We can evacuate our traffic from one of those regions at Amazon in about five minutes. I can move tens of millions of customers from one part of the world to another part of the world without them noticing. We literally built a way for us to run away from our problems. But that's one of those recovery methods because we don't know what it would take for prevention or how long it's going to take to fix. And there's somebody out there going, I just want to watch Ozark or whatever we put up on the screen, right? So these are some of those recovery kinds of thinking and some of those recovery kinds of techniques. Our industry has done prevention for a long time, right? We've had rate arrays and multiple rate arrays and multiple network paths and dual power supplies and multiple servers and racks and multiple servers and multiple data centers and multiple pathways and all of those kinds of things. All of those are preventative measures. Yet there's always something that comes in that we haven't thought of. This is how we make sure that we win those moments of truth for all the things we haven't been able to think of yet because we consider an ability to recover greater than prevention. They also say when you give a conference talk, you should, uh, you should make a promise, something your audience can look forward to being able to take away at the end of the day. So you always want to make that promise. You want to set that context. And most of all, you want to keep that promise. So keeping the promise of the title slide, what does incident management at Netflix Velocity look like today? So we need to set some goals. In order to be able to execute on anything, we needed to have some things that we were aiming for. We already set some expectations, right? We know the system's going to fail. We're going to invest in both some prevention work and some recovery work. But we need to be ready when those things don't work like they're supposed to. So one of our first goals for incident management is short. We want anything that impacts our customers to be as short and as shallow as possible. Maybe that goes without saying. But to bring in another saying, you can't change things you don't measure. If we're not looking at our behaviors and measuring them in time and how well we did and how well we executed, we're not going to be able to actually reach towards this goal of keeping those things as short and as narrow as possible. You know, I mentioned the regional evacuation. We statistic, or pardon me, strategically and purposefully built a way literally to run away, from, run away from our problems in service of this goal because then whatever happened is contained to the five-minute time it takes us to shift that global traffic. Another goal is that we want to make sure that they're unique. We don't want repeat failures. If we're doing our jobs well, each outage should be new and exciting, right? This should be something that we've never seen before. Because we're expecting failures, but I want them to be unique. However, occasionally, this sniff test fails. Something happens, and I think we've run into this before. There are two important points to recognize about that. Is that one, maybe you know, a possible solution already exists to get us out of this potential ditch. But two, it means we missed something from last time. And this is where it's important for us and for you. If you have any impacts or incidents or outages or whatever you call them that kind of fail the sniff test, this means that sometime before someone has already learned this lesson. And maybe, and in some cases, your customers have had to come along with you for this particular nasty ride. But somebody's learned that lesson and either didn't tell the story loud enough or codify the good behavior well enough. Now, we, we have great models for this. Humanity has been doing this for a long time. If you think about cautionary tales and folklore and fairy tales, that's what those stories were about. You know, this way there be dragons. So this is an important thing that we look at. We have this goal for them to be unique, but we want to make sure when we identify when they're not. And that leads us here. We want those outages to be valuable. We want them to be valuable because they're expensive. Outages and impacts are expensive in lots of different ways. Sometimes there's a financial cost to it. Sometimes there's a brand cost to it. Sometimes there's a project management cost to it. When we have to go pick up those fallen pieces, there's other work that I'm not doing now. So these outages are expensive in lots of different ways. So we want to make sure that we get every last bit of value that we can out of every one of those outages. So how do we go about that? We term that incident management. So how does incident management tactically solve some of these problems and meet some of those goals? We have lots of experts at Netflix. We have experts in video encoding, content delivery, CDN operations, cloud operations, Performance, software construction, UI, UX, high-speed caching systems, data persistence, algorithmic work. We have lots of experts. And they're in that particular realm 
you know, using those muscles every day. And Netflix has this operational philosophy, as we saw earlier, that you own it, you run it. These teams are responsible for architecting, designing, building, and operating these services. And oftentimes, those are the muscles that they're using. They're the experts in that particular service, but we've you know, we found out that not all software engineer, ops people, are all network people. They're not necessarily experts in that fraction of a percent. They're not experts in what to do when things fail. Very few of us are experts in things that we do some fractional percentage of the time. So we conscientiously chose to create a team of failure experts. They would be around and available to help those other service teams when those small fractional things hit them to have those exercise muscles, to be the experts in how do we go through this problem, how do we keep it short, how do we keep it unique, how do we keep it valuable. We we, we call that our core SRE team. So these are the SREs at Netflix that watch the system as a whole. They watch the behavior of all those different microservices and how they sit on top of Amazon, and they help those teams understand that and understand how to behave and provide guidance. We thought about calling it Team Failure, but there were some other problems with that particular naming. So we decided that we'd go with the core SRE team. So some of the tactics of actually getting this particular work done. What does this team do before those incidents happen? Expectation setting is an important part of this. Uh, There were a lot of us on the team that grew up doing operations work. You know, we were born in that fire and molded by it, and we had a lot of these expectations already. But as we went through this work with other teams, we found that not necessarily all software developers or network engineers or or content delivery engineers had that same kind of experience. Some of the expectations I had about behavior on call that were very natural to me were very brand new to them. So we set expectations about that behavior. And some of these are very basic things. When you're on call, it's probably good that you have, I don't know, maybe a laptop and a phone with you and Internet access. Maybe you should have power cables for those kinds of things. You should understand the metrics that describe your system. You should understand where those dashboards are. You should be able to understand what your logs mean. You should also understand that the rest of your team is your resource and you should know how to get a hold of them. Now, again, for those of us that grew up in ops, those seemed like very natural things, but we found that they were not for other people. So by setting those expectations and providing that training, we're already helping people to become more successful when those unpredictable things happened. It helps us keep in service to that goal of keeping our outages short. We do a lot of education and outreach, both inside the team and out. Being a centralized SRE team that watches the entire thing as a whole, we're in this, unique, uh, in this unique place where we get to see lots of different patterns from teams and how there's lots of different behaviors. We get to identify anti-patterns or successful patterns. So we invest in time going to the organization and training everybody else on this. Remember I said earlier when we failed that sniff test, that unique goal, because sometimes somebody had already failed this way and that story didn't get taken far enough? We do the same thing. We also get a little bit of payback in that, and we get to spend time with people designing the systems, and we get a deeper understanding of what they're doing and the whys and the hows. Even with all this work, occasionally things do still go wrong. So the team becomes very actively involved when those impacts happen. But since we have a you-run-it-you-own-it culture, we don't actually fix anything. For those of you who have met me before, you may consider that an enormous boon to your Netflix experience that Dave doesn't actually fix anything. So we don't assume that operational responsibility. They own it and they run it. But there's still parts of managing a successful incident that have a lot more to do than just the technical repair. So there's a lot of coordination work that needs to be done. Sometimes we have a little bit of a simpler outage and we have one team that created a problem. They're working through and fixing it. Our coordination needs are low. But oftentimes, because we have these complex intermixed systems, we have multiple engineering teams with different areas of expertise that operate in a different part of your unique Netflix experience that need to come together, understand their interactions, and figure out how to get the system back up and running. Like any other communication effort and coordination effort, that takes people that understand what that, uh, what that kind of thinking requires. There are times we engage with our security teams, with our PR teams, with our legal teams, and with our executive teams. Having all of that work going on while we're trying to rescue the service requires someone thinking about planning for and practicing coordination. There are pitfalls here. Sometimes we have teams that become tunnel-visioned. 
Their system has, has, has fallen over. It's doing weird things. Well, you know, if I can leave it in the broken state for another five or ten minutes, I'll collect enough data, we'll know what happened. They become very tunnel visioned on their particular service, and they've forgotten that there are millions of people being impacted by this. People have a different organizational view. How our customer service team views impact to customers and behaviors is different than how the security team views those impacts and behaviors, which is different than how the legal team sees those. This all comes down to the fact that complex systems fail complexly. And in order to get them back up and running, we need some coordination. This also helps with that short goal. The other important one is communication. Um, there, there's an old adage that says, no news is good news. This is horribly wrong when everything is broken. Because when things are broken, people want us to over-communicate. They want more information. I'm also lucky that I work in an organization where I have other very concerned employees, and when they find out that people can't press play, people start coming out of the woodwork. What's broken? What happened? How can I help? Have we tried these 97 other different things? And now there's 800 voices in a room that needs four people. So we have to, we, we coordinate that communication. We coordinate between engineers the way engineers need to talk and understand. We coordinate with the, with the customer service group and we communicate to them what our customers need to understand. We coordinate between different uh, engineering organizations. Again, this also helps with the short goal. Then finally, a process we call memorialization. Actually handling those incidents is the smallest part of our time that we spend. That's the tip of the iceberg. Underneath that is the 100x time that we spend in actually going out and learning about what happened. We want to go get those user stories. I want to understand what context did you have loaded up in your brain when this happened? What tools were you using? What problem were you trying to solve? I want to understand how did we get here together? How did the system end up in this particular state? So we go get those user stories and we coordinate those and we understand what's happening. We, we believe in uh, what we call the blameless incident reviews. Some people call them blameless postmortems. We avoid the term postmortem because nobody died. If you ever look at social media while Netflix is down, some people think they're dying. We've checked, nobody ever actually has. But this is an important process to make sure that we keep with that unique goal. So that's uh, incident management at, uh, at Netflix Velocity. If any of this is interesting to you at all, you can take a look at jobs.netflix.com. We're always hiring people. There's lots of Netflixers around today that would love to chat with you. One of those other important conference talk topics is they say you should always thank your audience. After all, they've sat here for 45 minutes listening to you yammer in front of slides. So thank you. I'm Dave Hahn. I'm with Netflix. This is where you can find me on the Internet. Please feel free to reach out. I'll be around for the next couple of days. We run out of time now. You can always come find me and ask to. Yeah. Yes, we do. We do chaos in the production environment because our customers don't talk to our QA or testing environment. Right. So, uh, why do we do uh, why, why do we do chaos in production, and how do you make that particular argument? As I kind of threw away earlier, my customers don't talk to my production environment, much like they don't talk to my laptop. It doesn't matter if the code works here beautifully. Um, where we're going to impact our customers is in that production environment. If anything else, that's where I want most of the stuff to happen. That's where I want the software to be most resilient and most tested and most preventative. Sure, you can still do chaos in your testing environment, make sure that you get some behaviors. Um, you will not reap all the benefits. So I know at least for us there are certain things that only happen in the production environment. We only get so much traffic at those places or we only actually get global traffic from customers and all those kinds of devices in that environment. It's unique enough that we have to do it there or we don't get all the benefits that we want. Any other questions? Anybody just want to wave as you walk on your way out? Yeah.
Oh, very, very much so. And so the, the question is, uh, kind of what point does prevention recovery either cross over or it's really not capable to prevent any further? So um, I, I had a whole set of slides that I wanted to go through um, that were based on a fabulous paper by Richard Cook that talks about how complex systems fail. Um, it's a great little six-page paper, very easy to read, 18 fabulous points about how complex systems fail. That's one of the things that led to our thinking. So one of those points I kind of half made earlier, we have these complex systems. These complex systems are heavily guarded against failure already, right? Those are our preventative measures at work. They're heavily and successfully defended against failure by groups of experts all the time, yet failure still comes into play. And ignoring the fact that failure will still happen in these, uh, in these uh, complex systems, believing that we can always prevent something from happening, all that does is highlight for us in a more painful way that we can't. There's a corollary to that that I like quite a bit, is that when you have these heavily defended systems, when we have all of these preventative measures in place, your systems are already running in a degraded mode all the time because you built all of those preventative measures into place, right? There's already some drive that's failed or some network path that's on a backup or something that's you know, doing some kind of exponential back off in order to try to reach success. So you're already in a degraded mode in a complex system for whose all failures you cannot figure out and you're never actually on the happy path. You don't have all that overhead you think you have because something's already failing. You don't have as much runway because something's already used some of it up. So that was part of the thinking here is that we have to be ready to recover. You know, and, it, and you get some of that hindsight bias of, well, had we thought about these 187 things, we wouldn't have run into this. Before today, I was, I was unaware of 181 of those things, right? So there's no way for me to do that. So dealing in reality, we have to think about recovery and recovery measures. Prevention's great. Prevent as much as you can. Prevention is not a bad idea. It's not a bad picture. It's just an incomplete picture. Any other questions? Is it on? I guess not. You okay. just, just, just yell. Oh, sure. is it on now? Try it again. Hello. There hey. we are. Um, Recovery. Yay. Yay. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned a little bit about hindsight bias, and I know you guys do um, incident reviews. Correct. Uh, do you guys, how much do you focus on things like uh, biases and heuristics and things along those lines? So, for instance, for the, uh, it's, my, my team of people are some of the primary people that coordinate and run these incident reviews, and bias training is one of the primary things that we do because it's, uh, uh, the biases are so, so dangerous when we're trying to meet those goals we talked about. You know, we, we don't want things to repeat, and we want them to be as short as possible. Mm -hmm. And nasty things like hindsight bias are like that list of 187 things or that, uh, you know, every problem is simple or recency bias, right? This broke yesterday and the day before must be the same thing today and I become completely blind to the thing that's actually bothering me. Um, we also talk about biases in talking to people. Um, there's, there's a lot of organizations that believe in the, you know, in the five whys portion of getting through that. We train against that because that actually engenders other biases and it engenders an adversarial relationship. So um, recognizing those biases and both learning how to look for them and training people on how to not bring them into those kinds of instant reviews is extremely valuable for us. It's something we spend time on. And every time we do it, we end up finding more things, more parts of this complex problem that we would have missed had we not done it. All right. Cool. Uh, another question real quick. Okay, we'll go there and then right um, over here. Do you guys do um, pre-mortems, anything like that? So kind of looking at what would be the most, um, most what would be failure um, before you actually implement a system? So yeah, it's a lot of our a lot of our resilience engineering team does that kind of work, and they're also the team that's behind uh, behind a lot of our chaos efforts. So when we started out with that simian army, that group of monkeys that was going to go around and do stuff to us, we learned a lot from it, but they were also brittle and high touch. So um, as I'm sure Nora will get into on Wednesday, we moved more toward a self-service chaos kind of model so that people could do exactly that kind of work. I have this assumption, let's go test it. Here's an entire list of assumptions we've learned from other systems. You like, would you like them applied to yours? So we do that very actively and we group it under the idea of resilience en engineering. Yeah, there's a question here. Um, innumerable to a degree. <laughs> Seven, seven. Yeah, let me let me bring up the slide. Um, 
there's so many of those failure modes and those preventative matters that happen within teams that are specific to what they particularly do that I'm, I'm not aware of. I become more aware of some of the larger ones like our regional evacuations, some of the, you know, some of the larger chaos efforts. Um, but there's an innumerable number because we encourage people to find the ones for the areas that they're experts in and find ways to exercise that. And it continues to grow. Yes. So when we're talking about like recovery, uh, so I'm thinking a lot, of, I to spend a lot of my time in descriptive systems. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of like, do you have particular advice or things that you seem to be successful on what type of reco recovery to think about? Because you can kind of think about recovery to consistency or mm -hmm. kind of just ability to produce to this this cluster. Right. Like, how do you think about recovery from that aspect, right? So sure. if you decided that recovery is your, your goal, how do you think about those branches? That's a good question. So I hate to say it depends, but it depends. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Recovery for the, the people that are responsible for my persistence systems and my caching systems are different than, than what recovery would look like for someone who's in a stateless microservice, right? So we have, we have different areas of recommendations. So stateless microservices, if they're properly architected, throw it away and start over. Yeah. We even will integrate um, uh, part, part of our alert system will automatically compare one you know, instance against a population. And if it smells funny, we don't even investigate it. We just get rid of it. That, that, that does us no good. Um, now, again, that, that moves a little differently depending on what you're working with. Um, it's hard to have that kind of stateless microservice shoot it in the head idea when you also have a large CDN out there in the world made up of real physical hardware, right? We have to think about different recovery modes for that. So, uh, you know, one of the techniques we use there, for instance, is that we make our clients as smart as we can. And whenever you press the play button on Netflix, you actually get multiple places in the world that are strategically located where you can go get the same content. So your client already knows... Oh, I, I can't get it from you know I can't get it from number one. It already knows how to go to number two, and if number two goes away, it knows how to go to number three. So that one's that one I guess crosses you know preventative and recovery a little bit, but it's the idea that for that particular you know service and mode, we had to come up with a different set of what does recovery look like than somebody writing a stateless application. Got you. And yeah, the, and there's and there's a few things by the way on our Netflix tech blog that go into more details for each situation that we've that we've gone into and we figured our way through. Got you. And one more question around the core SRE team. Mm -hmm. How do you define success for that? So you kind of have, I mean, a slightly smaller company. You have one kind of ops team, and then they kind of naturally evolve. How do you define success for the core SRE team with all of these stakeholders? Mm -hmm. So uh, our measurement comes in a couple of different ways. So um, we have a portion of the team that focuses on that education and outreach. And we can measure that much like you would, you know, other education and marketing campaigns, right? How many people have we talked to? Can we see a change in their behavior? Are we getting questions back? Are we getting requests for more of this kind of information? For the in-the-minute kind of stuff, there's some very traditional measurements there that we, we look very inwardly in on the team. Um, you know, uh, service owners are responsible for the behavior of their service, but when we have these complex outages, they don't necessarily see that their service is having a problem in the way they need to. So one of the measures we have for that first response portion of the team is how well do they know the organization and the systems well enough to go get the right people involved when something weird is going on. So that's one of our large measures of success is how quickly can we get to the right people. And then that, uh, that unique goal of, uh, of outages is very much on us. Because once we've seen something and we've gone through that blameless IR and we've gone through that memorialization process, if we see something pop up again, we know that we failed in some th in, in some fashion, right? You know, occasionally it happens again five minutes later. Yeah, I really can't have done too much about that yet. But, you know, something comes back three or four weeks later. I see where either we didn't communicate broadly enough, or we didn't engage enough people, or we didn't tell that cautionary tale wide enough that somebody couldn't go, oh, crap, that's in my service too, and I need to go fix it. So that's how we look at the success measure of that kind of team is the, is the second, the, um, uh, kind of the second feature impact that it has on the rest of the organization. It's very hard to measure directly, right? Yeah, you, don't, yeah. you don't want to be on an SRE team where they say, well, we had an outage, so that means you guys failed, right? Right, right. Yeah. 90 we, day, 99 we, we, we don't want to set up those outage, kinds yeah. of measurements because it doesn't meet our goals and it's not realistic. So we want to actually be measuring and actuating on things that we can change. Better engagement, better information, earlier engagement, learning more about how things are operating so we're, you know, we're more informed and we can help other people make better decisions. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. I'll be wandering around. Come find me.